Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to my book chat for Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone by Diana Gabaldon. Wow, to finally be saying those words is just, it blows my mind. It blows my mind that it's finally here, that I read this less than a week ago and that we're going to chat about it today. I'm going to try not to waste too much time. I got my water because I'm going to be talking a lot. I have no idea how long this video will be, um, but I'm going to do my best. So if you've never been to a book chat of mine before, I don't do them that often. I usually am just here giving my reviews of things and we move along, but oh, I just have so many feelings. It's so hard to put into words. So we'll see how this is going to go. I have three pages of notes. Um, if you have watched my previous book chats for the series, I obviously have a playlist. I will have it linked. Um, each book has been a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes I go through parts. Sometimes I go by characters. Sometimes I go by events. Um, this time I will be going by character again because I feel like that's going to be the best way to get through this book. This is going to be obviously a full spoiler chat. Uh, and the comments down below so if you haven't read the book yet maybe don't stay if you're here just because you want to know what's happening and you don't want to read this huge book I understand I have plenty of fans who they've only watched my reviews they haven't actually read them um, I think you're probably missing out I am not the best person out there to give you all the details but I'm gonna do my best I'm gonna do my best today um, yes I am wearing my Fraser clan scarf that I got off of Redbubble quite a few years ago. Um, yeah, this is going to be intense and I'm going to do my best. And as I always say at the beginning of the book chat, this isn't necessarily about me going point by point through everything. There's no way I could do that for a 900 page book. The hardcover is 888 pages. The Kindle version I read was 960 pages. Like there's a lot. Okay. Um, I read this book between three different forms. I had the Kindle ebook, which delivered to me at 11 p.m. on the 22nd. I got the Audible upgrade, which was only $7.50 for a 50-hour audiobook. And then while I was traveling and at my sister's, I listened to the book and read from the hardcover. And I have a signed edition coming soon. So for now, we'll put this up here. But I probably will have to take it down at different times. Here we'll move more Olympus. We'll make it all about all about the book there. So, okay, I've already raced to three minutes just going around. So go tell the bees that I'm gone. This is book nine in the Outlander series, saga, whatever, by the Queen herself, <clears throat> Diana Gabaldon. The reason that we're all here. Um, this book came out in 2021. Don't know when you're watching this video. It was already kind of crazy going back and looking at some of my other reviews to see how I did this because I haven't done one of these in a year. It's been over a year since I did one. This book starts on June 17th of 1779 and it goes through, um, it doesn't have an exact end date, but it goes through the spring of 1781 and we are on Fraser's Ridge in North Carolina, South Carolina. My brain doesn't even know right now. Um, and our loved ones go between some other places too. They go between, they're in Savannah, they're in Salem. Those are kind of the main places. But all in all, this book is a little more contained than the previous one. You know, the previous one being in three different time periods in two different countries and just all over the dang place. Um, at least this one, we are in America the whole time and things are still happening. It's very interesting. So yeah, we're going to go through the characters, like I said, but this isn't going to be super organized. It's a book chat. So, you know, if you've been around me at all, like if you're a regular viewer, you know, my brain kind of ping pongs everywhere. Um, in the discussions, please feel free to, you know, anything you feel like I haven't talked about, mention it. I want this to be a discussion forum. Um, that's the best part about the comment sections on these videos. I still get comments on the videos all the time um, because there's no, again, there's no way I'm going to be able to talk about everything. And if I didn't talk about your favorite part, it's not because it wasn't important. It's because 
I have 900 pages of book that I'm trying to fit into hopefully under an hour long video. It's just not going to happen. But we're going to go through characters. And if I end up sticking to that, if I'm able to go character by character, I will try to have chapter times down below. I just don't think that, oh, I'm going to tell you everything about Jamie and then move on to the next person because they don't interact in a bubble. They are with everyone else. But yeah, so we'll kind of go through this and we'll kind of go through what's happening with the characters like part by part and we'll see. So grab your whiskey, grab your water, grab a snack. Let's do this. Okay. So at the beginning of this book on June 17th, 1779, our beloved Mackenzie's are there on the ridge with the Frasers um, in the beginnings of a new big house because Jamie is going to rebuild because after the uh, Frasers were, you know, the uh, everything burned down basically is the point. Everything burned down before they had left and been traveling with the army and before all that stuff had went down, um, everything had burned. And so we're going to have to rebuild. Bree and Roger's cabin is burned down. Um, the big house is burned down. We need to start fresh, right? But it's just was so nice to have them be back to be, you know, all laying in a pile around the fire and they're just, they're home, they're back. And it immediately, like I was, I was crying while I was reading it. I've, I've seen a few other people's reactions that they were crying in the beginning as well, because gosh, the, the longing that we've read from, from both families in the past two books when they were separated was just so painful. You know, it was so painful. You know, Brie and Roger are missing their family and Brianna and Claire or Claire and Jamie, they know that it's safest for their family to be in the future and they want them to be there, but it is, it's tough for them. You know, it's really tough for them to be separated. And so when they get to come home, there's two main feelings that they feel. And both Jamie and Claire are like, what happened that was so bad in the future with all your modern conveniences that your only choice was to come back to us. So that's a good portion of the first part of this book is slowly that story comes out of what's happened in books, you know, in the last two books for Brie and Roger and with Rob Cameron and with um, Roger going to 1739 and seeing Brian Frazier and Blackjack and Jenny um, because Jenny is on the ridge now. She lives with Ian and Rachel and their son. So it's just very interesting. More and more people too are knowing about the time travel. And that's something that's very interesting because it isn't a secret that they're trying to keep too closely anymore. It's really kind of out there. So one of the things that Jamie struggles with a lot during this book, particularly in the first half of it, is Claire's husbands. <laughs> That's the one I put in my notes. Um, she, you know, had that experience with Lord John where she was married to him though not legally because we know Jamie is still alive and had slept with him and you know Jamie and John's friendship is pretty broken because of this. Jamie doesn't think he can ever forgive John for that and he's still struggling with forgiving Claire. Um, there are multiple instances in the beginning where Jamie is just he's struggling with it. He's very angry about it and he says that he didn't forgive her. He's still working through it. And there's a few angry sex sessions because of that. I forgot how clean Diane actually writes her love scenes. Like there's really no steam to them at all. They're all like the emotional punch that comes with it. Um, it's not that she didn't write them more in past books, but she doesn't really detail anything now, which I guess I just noticed more too, because I mostly read smut and, and <laughs> romance. But as I've said many, many times, like this is still the most beautiful filled out romance I've ever read, you know? And to be fair, like in this book, Jamie and Claire, but are like, Jamie is, uh, turned 60 during this book. 
and like Claire is 63, 64, so it's not like we need detailed sex scenes for them anyway. Although I know I'm on the younger end of the readers here. There's people who've been reading about Jamie and Claire for 30 years and have aged with them or are older than them. And I'm not saying you shouldn't still be getting it. I'm just saying that I understand why Diana doesn't need to have detailed sex scenes for grandparents because, you know, that can just stay where it is. You get it, Grandma, but, you know, we don't want to see it, right? <laughs> So he's really grappling with that. Something else that brings Frank to his mind very strongly is that when Bree and Roger came back this time, they bring some things with them, which I think is totally smart. Like I would absolutely bring them with me, but it's also kind of like, I wonder if any of that will bite them in the butt, but they bring books. Mostly what they bring back is books and a few other little things, but she brings back Frank's latest book that he wrote, which is called The Soul of a Rebel, and it's about the Scottish people in America, because, of course, Frank was looking into that. And there's actually, like, it's funny, there's actually, you know, an author's picture of Frank on the back of the book, and so Jamie gets to see what he looks like for the first time and realizes that he looks just like Blackjack and is like, Claire, why did you never tell me that Frank looks like Blackjack? And Claire explains, well... Number one, I didn't want to like disturb you about it. And number two, she was like, I really only thought that Blackjack looked like Frank a couple of times. She's like, once I got to know the heart of this man, Frank is nothing like that. You know, she, she very much, she's like, Frank was a good man. You know, relatively speaking. Compared to Blackjack, yes, Frank was a good man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a Frank hate channel, just so you know not a big fan but so there's this book that Frank wrote and Brianna had brought it back because she hadn't read this one yet and she wanted to bring something of her father there and and I suppose too to have like you know a picture to show her children about what their you know adopted grandfather had looked like right so this book has a lot of details, you know, about what was happening in the Americas during this time. And there is specifically some battles that are mentioned. And there is also the death of a man named Jamie Frazier, James Frazier, that is mentioned. And Jamie thinks about this and he doesn't know whether Frank wrote this in there knowing that someday Brianna and Roger would go back again, like that they would do that. Like, honestly, and I don't know this where are the details that he was finding it but Jamie being the smart man that he is is like who's to say that he doesn't know how all this plays out for us and did he write this in this book that this James Fraser dies at this specific battle just to fuck with me or did he write it as a warning like what is it you know it's tough to know whether Frank was really doing that level of inception or whether he's just saying the facts, you know? And so that's something that Jamie is grappling with. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to go over Jamie as a character for the most part, all with this. So we're going to keep going through it. There's also, um, we're dealing with Jamie getting older during this. He sustains some serious injuries during this book. He does not die. I know there's always that speculation that goes around and I stand by it. Jamie Fraser is going to live until the end of these fucking books, everyone. Okay? He will. I very much hope that Diana will end it and everyone's still alive. But if he were to die, it's not going to be before the series is done. Okay? That's not going to happen. I know these aren't classified as a romance. But we're not going to kill off the main couple. Half of the main couple before this is over. Anyway, point being. But he does sustain some serious injuries. Like, the man just continually gets beat up. He get, He's in a grapple with a bear in the beginning of this book. And then there is a mutiny on the ridge that happens. This is kind of a big thing. Some of the tenants that Jamie has taken into his ridge, which we are at, over 75 families are living here. And about half of them are loyalists, okay? That means they're for the crown. And we have this one specific... Uh, naval captain who ends up living there with his mother. His name is Captain Cunningham. His mother's name is Elspeth. Elspeth, who we'll talk about when we get to Claire's section because she has some interactions with her. But he wants to, at one point in the, in the book, he wants to capture Jamie 
and turn him in to like prove his loyalty. And there is quite a few tenants who are loyalists who go along with this and who um, there ends up being like a rebellion. There's kind of this like civil war that happens on the ridge and both Jamie and Cunningham get really hurt. Jamie gets, I can't remember what his injury is, but Cunningham actually becomes paralyzed from the waist down because he gets shot in the back. Not by Jamie. Jamie shot him in the front, <laughs> but he got shot in the back somehow. Um, and yeah, so this rebellion happens and Jamie actually banishes every man who was involved. He banishes them and their families. And this leads the wives and the children of these men to come back to Jamie and beg him for mercy. And of course, Jamie is a tender-hearted fool, a tender-hearted fool. <laughs> and what he does though is he terminates his deal with the men and he writes new contracts with the wives. And so now if their hu their husbands are allowed to work the land with them and to still be there, but the husbands have to come and apologize to him. And if they cause any more trouble, he won't ask any questions. They'll be killed on site if they cause any more trouble. We don't hear any more trouble yet in this book, but that's an, it goes quite a few ways through there. So that is a lot of what Jamie is struggling with. And then we have our battle. We have, oh, okay. We have a couple more things to mention with Jamie. We have Ulysses, Ulysses, Ulysses show up, who, if you remember, he was the manservant of Jocasta. He also had had a long-term affair and probably like one or two like children with other people there, but he was a longtime manservant of Jocasta. He was a freed man. She had freed him, but he still remained her manservant. And he was actually responsible for some tomfoolery that happened at River Run. And he had to run away or else be, you know, prosecuted, which he, he basically, he would have been, you know, like hanged without question just because of the color of his skin at that time. But Jocasta and her husband, they moved, I think, to Canada to just, like, get out of it because they were in kind of a dangerous situation. And Ulysses uh, changed his name and joined the uh, crown, in service of the crown, because they have some black regiments, some African-American regiments, where slaves could join and then be freed, but also... Ulysses joined so that he could gain some rank and power and he pulls a fucking power play where he shows up on the ridge basically trying to invalidate Jamie's claim on the land because when Jamie had first got this land from Governor Tryon which happened way back in the fourth book this happened over 10 years ago in the timeline it was quite a while ago he had signed it saying that he wasn't Catholic, I believe is what happened. But we always knew that this was kind of like a double edged sword because Tryon knew that he was Catholic, but they said that he wasn't on the thing. And if anyone, you know, if Tryon had ever wanted to usurp Jamie, all he would have to do is invalidate this letter. Well, we haven't heard much about like, we haven't heard anything about this for years and years. Well, Ulysses, uh, he, he, I'm not completely clear. And someone can correct, please feel free to correct me on this because there's so much information here. But basically, he now has a letter from a saying that because there is no current governor of the area that this this land grant is invalidating and that they could take it back. And I believe Ulysses, number one, just wanted to stick it to Jamie because he doesn't like him. And he's Jamie finding out what Ulysses did is part of the reason why he had to leave River Run. Um, and also... Ulysses is hoping that as a reward, maybe that he could get some of this land if he's the one who gets it away. So this leads to more fighting going on. There is a Stromish, Squamish, whatever it's called that happens between there. Um, and we are able to like get that letter back as well as a copy of Jamie's like original thing. And we save that land that happens. But then there is a battle that happens where Jamie has to go with the militia to fight the Redcoats in a certain place. And this is the battle where he almost dies. He gets shot many times and he is left basically dead. And so I'm going to pause with Jamie and we're going to go on to Claire now because the stuff that's happening with Claire, 
will show us how she's able to save Jamie. Okay. And I spent quite a long time on Jamie, but he has the most kind of going on and everything. So we have Claire who in the beginning, Claire actually doesn't have a ton of like character arc type of things going on, but you know, obviously she's the like main thread that pulls everyone, pulls everyone through most of the time. But so in the beginning of the book, you know, Claire's dealing with some guilt over Jamie killing her rapist that happened in book eight that one of two men who had actually raped her was actually living in like Salem was living nearby and Jamie discovers it and he kills the man and he leaves behind his dog who is a blue tick coon hound which made me really happy I grew up with those um, and a few, like, I don't even know what the timeline is, how much later this dog actually shows up on the ridge and follow them home and they end up adopting this dog. And Claire's very unsettled about this. Um, and Jamie sees it as more of just like, no, like we should give the dog a home because we killed her master, but that doesn't mean that we need to feel guilty about what we did. Like that man raped you and I took my vengeance and it's that simple because that's the way Jamie Fraser thinks. He thinks that way. So we adopt this dog named Bluey and actually their foster daughter, I didn't mention her yet. Um, Jamie and Claire are, have a foster daughter named Frances who William, Jamie's son, asked them to take care of after her older sister, Jane, who was a prostitute. Um, she killed a man who was going to rape Frances and then she was going to be killed because of that. And she hung herself and Jamie and William were not able to save Jane. And so William asked Jamie and Claire to take Francis home with them. So they have a foster daughter who she's about like 11 and 12, 13 during this book. And so she adopts Bluey as her dog. Um, Francis is, I kind of just squished her in with Jamie and Claire, but she is just the sweetest girl and she has a great time with all of the grandkids there and all that good stuff and everything. But just want to mention her. But anyway. So Claire is kind of busy with her, busy getting her new surgery put together, busy taking care of all the little things that they come across on the ridge. Um, for quite a bit of the first part of the book, you know, whatever Jamie's going through, Claire is there. Like I said, there's a lot of like fights between the two of them, dealing with Jamie's struggling with forgiving her for what happened with Lord John. He's struggling with these thoughts he's having about Frank. So there are quite a few like arguments that they have about this, just working through everything. Um, then there is Claire slowly coming into her power. So way back in book four, I think it was when Claire met with, um, some of the Indian women, one of them had said that when you, when your hair is white, you will come into your full power. And so that we aren't sure what this power is, but there is some talk about it in this book. When Roger is now back, she is taking a look at his throat. You know, he had, she had had to do a tracheotomy on him when he was hung. And Roger had actually had an experience with a traveler who was a healer. And he had this blue light that would come from his hands. And there was a moment where he put his hands on Roger's throat and this blue light and this warming sensation came and Roger felt better for a time. And Roger and Claire in the beginning have some discussions about that and like what it might be and those things. So we do see this like blue light come up a few times and specifically two major times that it happens in this one. And so her hair is going more and more white through this book. And I believe by the end of the book, she does have white hair now is what it sounds like to me. Diana's using some kind of allegories with it. So I don't know if it's the moonlight in her hair or like what was going on, but I believe we got there. There are two specific incidents where I see this happen. One of them is they get a desperate call in the middle of the night, Jamie and Claire do. And this little girl named Agnes shows up and says her mother is in labor and she's been in labor all day. And Usually her mother has very quick labors. These are like her fifth and sixth children. Oh, I just gave it away. Surprise when Claire gets there, it's twins. <laughs> That's what's going on. The 
the way it sounds is that the two twins are kind of like entangled and one of the twins may be like stillborn and it's in the way of the healthy twin. And so Claire is just about to do a C-section, which will pretty surely kill the mom, but maybe they'll be able to save babies. Um, because either, either way, if like the twins get stuck and they can't get them out, then the mom will die anyway, but whatever. And then something happens and one of the babies shoots out and it's a baby boy and he's alive and it's wonderful. And then a baby girl comes out and she's not breathing. And it's this very emotional punch because Jamie is there with her because this was the middle of the night. So he went with her and they kind of have this moment of, because he never got to see Faith their daughter who died 30 some years ago in Paris and it's this like beautiful moment where he's kind of seeing like wow is this what she would have looked like and Claire's just so heartbroken she doesn't want to lose this little girl and so she's holding her and Jamie's like let me take her from me and she's like no no and so she just won't stop she's like rubbing her and she's thinking her and there's a blue light that comes from her hands and all of a sudden the little girl takes a breath. So I would call that magic if I was you, because let us not forget these books definitely have an element of fantasy. There can be magical healing and never was there a better time than to have Claire save this baby girl twin. I'm completely fine with this being a magical moment. Okay. I got no problems with it. So that gives us something to think about because she knows that this was no work of her healing self. This was definitely a magical moment that this happen you know so that is the first instance we see of this and I had kind of an inkling right like I had kind of an inkling because Jamie has read in this book that James Fraser will die at this certain battle that happens and we're seeing Claire more and more come into her power um and so that's what made me kind of think that okay Jamie is going to be very close to death and she's going to be able to pull him back and so as I had left us with kind of a cliffhanger with the Jamie part, Jamie is like almost dead. He's been shot so many times. He's lost so much blood and Claire is there. And of course we hear in the battle, she sees someone with Jamie's rifle and she's like, where is he? And the guy's like, he's dead. I took it off a dead man. And she's like, no, you fucking didn't. And she goes and finds him. And sure enough, he's barely alive when she's there. And then he, he isn't and she refuses to step away and Ian is like auntie let's just bring him home like let's we'll take him home and she's like no and so she won't leave him and of course isn't clear <clears throat> what happens but she just won't leave him and she's talking to him and she's calling him and she has her hands on his chest and she won't let him go and then we come to the beginning of a chapter and she's waking up and he's alive. And so there was that, I'm not sure if it's Ian who says it or if it's someone else, but it's definitely from that power again that she's able to hold him there. So, so then that leads us to wonder, was Frank fucking with him or was he telling the truth? Was Jamie supposed to die on this field? And then instead Claire is, you know, changing history by saving him. Who knows? We don't have to know how that figures out. But the point is, Jamie Fraser is alive at the end of this. He is very hobbled, though, okay? He's, he has to use a cane. His leg is very messed up. He is much weaker than he's almost ever been. Like, it's been a long time since he's been hurt this much. And it just really, my feeling at the end of this book was just like, specifically for Jamie, is I was like, wow, I'm really feeling what his age is. And I do a lot of comparison. I try not to do this too much because obviously I have serious desire for Jamie, but there were definitely aspects about like things that Jamie says in the way he's feeling that remind me of my own father, who my dad is 58. So I kind of always look at that of like, yeah, my dad still got it. My dad still moves around. My dad is still like a hunter and uh, takes care of his animals and does all those things. But like, it's hard for him to wake up in the morning sometimes and his arthritis in his hands and his joints don't work. And it's like, that is, it's not that he's at the end of his rope. Like Lord willing, my dad has 30 years yet to go, but he's at that edge of you're not a young man. You're not in your prime anymore. And that is a hard thing to watch happen for both Jamie and Claire, you know? 
Okay, so those are kind of the big moments with Jamie and Claire. Let's keep moving along um, to some other people. So it's the big stuff that happens with Brie and Roger. Let's talk about them next. I love the Mackenzies. You know this. I really do, particularly through my reread of these books. If you watched my reviews, like I have such a heart for Brie. I feel for her so much. In this, in this book, Brie and Roger are in like Brie is going to be like 33 to 34. Roger is like 40 to 41. They have an age gap of like seven years. I just wanted to remind us of that because I went through the ages. Brie is the hard one to figure out because she's born in one century, goes back, goes back. Goes, it's all over the place. Who knows? But she's about 34. Roger's about 41. They start this book with two children <laughs> and they end it with three. There it is. I'm saying it. Okay. Brie and Roger have a third baby in this book. I know I'm jumping to the end, but I'm so excited about it. But I want to tell you a quick little story. So I totally spoiled myself for this and I'm very sad about it. I didn't mean to. So the thing is, when you're reading this book, there is a family tree at the beginning of the book. So you know who everybody is. And then there was a family tree at the end that had the additions because there are um, quite a few babies that come into being during this book. And I was just flipping to see where the end of the book was and I accidentally flipped to the family tree and saw that there was another Mackenzie at the end of the line. And I was like, no, I just ruined it for myself, but it's okay. It was a good spoiling to have. Um, Brie is just as badass as ever in this one. She does work a little bit more with her artist's soul in this one though, because, um, okay, so they come back, Roger and Brie are back. She's doing her hunting and um, helping provide for the ridge with her dad because Brie is like the best hunter after Ian and Jamie. She's a badass. And she is, of course, back to help make all the scientific improvements that we can for the time that we have, including, um, you know, we want to have indoor plumbing this time and we want to have just all the amazing things that she can create. So she has a couple big things happen for her. Number one, this time having come back and forth through the stones, she is having fibrillations with her heart. Now, Claire says these are for sure, mostly positively not dangerous to you. They're like, they feel kind of like panic attacks when she has them, but they're pretty like intense in a couple of the months after she's went through the stones. Um, and so she is kind of worried about that. And there's actually a time where earlier in the book, when she's going to tell Roger about her heart and he thinks that she's telling her she's pregnant. And so she's just like, you motherfucker, I'm not pregnant. Okay. And he's like, Oh, okay. 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 I know. I don't want you to be in danger. I just, you know, I would love if we had a baby, but like, I get it. You know, one of those, cause Roger, Roger always wants more children, which is beautiful. I love that. And it's not that Bree doesn't want it, want more children, but you know, her first birth with Jem was very intense. Mandy having the heart condition, which made them have to go to the future. You know, if they had that happen again, what would they do? Like, would they be able to go through again? And would the child be able to go through again is the thing too. Um, there actually is some, um, when Jamie is writing his, when Jamie is writing his like will at the end, <laughs> He, he always says that he wants them all to go back to the future if he's not there because it really is the protection of this great man that keeps a lot of them safe because there are a lot of people that would come for them if Jamie wasn't there. It's his reputation and his strength that keeps them safe. And that's another thing to think about when Jamie's getting weak. But anyway, my point being, um, so she's really nervous about that, but Claire's like, you're going to be okay. And then, um that third baby happens very much near the end of the book. Um, and his name is Davy. So we're excited about that. But earlier in the book, this actually happens in part two of the book. Brianna is picking wild grapes with Amy Higgins and a couple of their kids are with, and Amy gets eaten by a bear. Like I don't, there's not a delicate way to say this. Okay. It's, it's, horrific. It happens so quickly. They're right there. And all of a sudden she's been pulled down the side of a hill. Brie goes to look and literally it's chomping on her head. It's horrifying. 
the ba bears are a big fucking trouble in the beginning of this book like they like jamie gets into a struggle with one where it steals his like deer and then yeah this bear just takes her and brie watches this happen the kids are right there they bring her back and like claire has to like basically sew this woman back together and that's when we have our first connection actually with Elspeth Cunningham I never did bring her up during the Claire section but she's the mother of that man who caused trouble for Jamie and she thinks that Claire's a witch but they end up having this very interesting relationship where they're like not overly friendly but they also like really respect each other but they have to like sew Amy back together it's so sad and so Bobby our sweet Bobby our awkward Englishman who by the way he has the murder brand on his face because he was a convicted murderer before he came to the ridge um he's left with Aiden and I, I wrote it down he's left with Aiden and Ori who I believe are Amy's kids from her first husband and then Rob is their son together and he's left as a widower of three little boys and it's so sad it's so sad and that really affects Brie quite a bit because she's there and she realizes that it literally could have been her like it was just a matter of a couple seconds where they were both there and Brie turns to go and Amy's following her and Amy gets taken and so it's a very like shaking thing it really shakes the ridge up a lot but then Brie uh, gets invited by Lord John to come do some portraits for wealthy people. And this ends up being a good opportunity because the Frasers want to smuggle some things into that town. <laughs> um, and she decides that she will go. She also hopes that this will, you know, she wants to start to mend the trouble between Lord John and Jamie. And also her brother William is in that town as well. And this could be a chance for her to get to actually talk to him because she did meet him at the end of um, a Breath of Snow and Ashes, but it was when she was on her way back to the future and she didn't think she'd ever see him again. So she was like, yo, hi, and then left. And that's all that they had had. Um, and this also works because Roger, he wants to be officially ordained as a minister. He was only had like the first level of it before. So he could do like, he could do like births and funerals, but he technically shouldn't have been doing like weddings or anything. But when you don't have any kind of preacher, like, mm. so they're going to go to do that. And when they do, they bring Jermon with them, who Jermon has been staying with the Frasers because after Henry Christian died, it was just very difficult for Marsali and Fergus. And Jermon, he really blamed himself for all of it, which of course it wasn't his fault. There was a fire. It was a horrible situation. Um, but he's been staying with the Frasers. And so he goes home to his parents. And when we go see Fergus and Marsali, we find out they've also had surprise twins who they name, um, Alexander and then Charles Clare. So they're actually named after their grandparents because Alexander is one of Jamie's names and, um, Claire obviously speaks for itself. So that was really beautiful. We don't get enough time with Marsali and Marsali and, Fergus but it seems that Fergus is doing really well but he is also being very bold like he is fighting for the rebel cause he is in danger a lot of times for that and so there actually is a part later on in the book where he sends all of the children except the baby so he sends Germain, Felicity and Joan like back to the ridge again because it's too dangerous where they are. You know, they, someone tries to start a fire again when they're there and it's just, it's very dangerous. But Fergus is like, if not me, then who, you know? And oh, I just love that. I really hope that they're okay. But anyway, I jumped into them a little bit, but yeah. So Brie and Roger get to, they stay with them for a while. And then Brie goes on to do this portrait and she doesn't end up just doing a portrait for these wealthy people. She ends up getting kind of pulled into um, help with some portraits of the dead who have died in battles. And yeah, so she literally does death portraits for a while. That's very intense. Um, she does get to meet William and see him. We'll get to William in just a minute, but yeah, I just really, 
I just really love that. I love Brie so much. I love her. So then a little more details on Roger. So there's some great stuff. Like he gets ordained for sure. It's really cool because on the ridge, they rebuild like the meeting house and they have like all their services there. So like Roger does his service. Captain Cunningham, I guess, is a different religion as well. And so he does his services. And then Rachel, they have meeting time for the Quakers, which is just Rachel. But, you know, Ian and Jenny go and then some other people will go as well. And they just have kind of like sharing time. And it's like quiet, but they have that. So that's great. But yeah, so Roger has that going for him. I actually feel like we don't get to see quite enough of Roger, in my opinion, because when we are like Bree and Roger is gone from the ridge for quite a while with that stuff. And so we don't get to see a ton of them, but it's okay. It was good. And then I wanted to mention, because in the beginning, when they're back, we're, they're talking about how they ended up coming back to 1779. Um, and when Bree and Jem and Mandy all went to get Roger, they were in, they like, they find him and then they go back through the stones and they get stuck. They get stuck. And they believe maybe that when they're within the stones that they're kind of like inarticulate pieces just going through. I don't know. They don't know the science behind this. I don't know either. I'm just a romance reader. I don't know. But there's this beautiful moment at the end of the one chapter where Roger's like, so we, we didn't know we were stuck. We didn't know where to go and Mandy started saying grandas pixie, grandas pixie. And so they all started remembering this one story that they told about Jamie and they're able to make it to the ridge. And so by thinking of Jamie, they were able to get there. And so Jamie is really emotional and Jem is like, it's okay, granda, don't cry. You're the one who brought us here safe. And it just. So yeah, okay, got to keep it moving, got to keep it moving. So we'll touch real quick on, um, let's touch real quick on William since I mentioned him. William, a lot of his, is he's in Savannah, he's there with his dad, he's just, his dad, he's really trying to work through a lot of the emotions he feels still um, after losing Jane and then discovering that Ben isn't really dead. His cousin Ben, he went to find his body and it was not his body like it was the body of a thief um, because it was like missing ears it isn't ben um, and so ben's widow amaranthus and his son trevor have been staying with the grays and it turns out that ben isn't dead which we suspected he's changed his name and he actually married somebody else. So he's a bigamist too. Everyone's just a bigamist here. But even more than that, it turns out that Amaranthus knew because he decided to turn coat and he's actually become a loyalist. He's fighting for the revolution. And she was like, you can't do that because it will destroy everything. So why don't you pretend to be dead and reinvent yourself so much? And I say that callously, but like, really that was the best thing for amaranthus is now if she's a widow she'll be treated honorably instead of the wife of a traitor you know so she's looking out for her and her son now william starts to have some feelings for amaranthus there's some little kissy kissy smoochy smoochy happening between them and they kind of go like back and forth with that but i do believe that something will happen with them only william runs into some problem while well, his father runs into some problems. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute because I want to end with what's going on with Lord John. But anyway, William gets to meet with Bree more. They get to talk and bond and it's great. Love it. Love Will. Well, I don't love William, but he's not horrible in this one's great. So then Ian and Rachel and Jenny, we'll touch on them real quickly. So Ian is his wonderful self. And the big journey for Ian and Rachel in this book is that Ian receives word that Emily, his ex-Indian wife, <laughs> her husband recently died in a battle and left her and her sons alone. Now, one of these sons, her oldest son, is Ian's son, okay? They had lost three children together who weren't able to live outside the womb. They're, Ian and Emily are not completely compatible, like, physically to have children, um, but Totus, who is the 
his he's like chases the lizards or something is the name but they call him totus he is ian's son we're pretty sure that the last time they they were together that this happened and ian had actually went and seen him in a previous book and he's the one who named him and everything because the uh mohawk believe that your name comes to you later on you know kind of thing so he wants to go see her and see if he can help take care of her or whatever and rachel agrees and she's like yes you should now rachel's very insecure that he'll want to be with emily because he's like you didn't leave emily emily's the one who kicked you out and if she decides she wants you back maybe you go back to her and ian's like no that's crazy i just want to make sure she's okay and so when we go and meet her a couple things happen um number one she ends up asking him to take totus because she is going to be marrying someone else and that someone else may not want her children by another man so he's like how about you take him and ian's like heck yes i will i will take my son and it's a really beautiful moment and emily ends up naming their son who's been going by oglethorpe as like a placeholder name how about that for a placeholder name and she names him hunter now emily doesn't even know that rachel's maiden name was hunter so yeah so his name now is hunter which is so cute i love that now on their journey to meet emily um ian and rachel are asked by jamie to stop in and see about sylvia hardman who is a quaker woman who has now become a prostitute to take care of her two children when her husband died in the war and she actually helped jamie in a previous book when his back spasmed and he was trapped away from claire and so jamie asks him to check in and make sure she's okay well when ian arrives there sylvia is actually being beaten by the man who is her current protector and so ian kills him and they need to bury him and then ian says how about you come with me to the ridge um my grand my my uncle would definitely want you to come with us and she's like oh your mother and he's like you don't even know like seriously mother claire auntie claire she will not care at all which of course she wouldn't. So Sylvia, she has her two children, Prudence and Patience, and then Chastity, who is actually her daughter through one of her liaisons, one of her protectors. She doesn't know which one. So she's actually with them when they meet Emily. Now, Emily is there with um, a couple other Native Americans in this town. And one of the people who's there, who's married to an Indian woman, is Sylvia's husband, who's not dead, and he wants to take the children that are his but doesn't want chastity. And he tells Sylvia, well, the Mohawk can have more than one wife. Is it Mohawk? I'm not sure if it's Mohawk, so don't uh, take... I can't remember which group there was, so sorry. I, that was wrong. And she's like, uh, no, I'm not going to be a bigamist just so you can have our children around. You left me, and I've had to become a prostitute to take care of your children. And so she's like, no, that's not going to happen. And he puts up a big fight about it. And Ian's like, she's not leaving her children with you. You're just going to have to deal with it. Sorry. So long story short with that, Ian, Rachel, Hunter, Jenny, and then Sylvia and her three children, they all go back to the ridge together, as well as the Sachem decides to come with them as well, because he has a little thing for Jenny. So he's around too. The Sachem is, I think he is a mediator and um translator for the natives so that's cool but anyway so they all come back and as a cute little aside we'll just say this sylvia and her three children end up marrying bobby with his three sons and it is the cutest wedding ceremony you've ever seen because as quakers they just say i marry thee i marry thee i marry thee um, and it's so cute because the kids actually say, we marry you, we marry you, we marry you. And I just burst into tears. It was beautiful. So Sylvia and Bobby are now going to have their brood of their six children. So that made me happy because poor Bobby. Like, oh. Okay. So what I want to end this with is we're going to talk about what's going on with Lord John. And then I'm going to make a prediction about the mystery that is over the whole series about the ghost of um jamie that we see in outlander because i have a theory that i believe is my best theory that i've had come to this point okay so lord john gray 
he is having visits from Percy Wainwright during this book, which we know Percy is actually his stepbrother. He's also someone that they have had intimate relations with before. And Percy is a lot of things. Per perseverance. He is just a lot of things that I don't have the time to go into right now. But he does still love John, but he's also a coward. Okay. Now there's this man named Ezekiel Richardson, who is a traveler. Okay. He is a traveler and he believes that the biggest mistake Britain, England, the motherland ever made was giving up on the American revolution. And if that they had just stuck it out, they could have won the revolutionary war and America would still be under their thumb today. And he, him and a group of people who we don't know completely who these are, have narrowed it down to a couple of key events that happen that get Parliament to give up on the war. And one of those events is a speech that Hal, who is Lord John's older brother, he makes a speech to Parliament that kind of is starting to convince them to give it up. Now, it's not the single event that will make that happen, but it is one of the key events that they see as stopping it. And so they take Lord John captive. They have him up on charges of like sodomy and basically are, you know, accusing him of being gay, which isn't a lie, but horrible that they would do that. And if Hal gives that speech to Parliament, they will kill him. So Lord John has been held captive for quite a few months on this one ship that they keep moving around so that no one can find it. So William gets told by Percy. So Percy, again, kind of a wimp, but he does really love John, but he's also scared because he's a pussy. Pardon me. He gets word to William. So near the end of this, um, Amaranthus and William are staying in Lord John's house. They don't know what's been going on. And Percy is able to warn William. And he tells William, this is what's happening. How are we going to help your dad? And he's like, well, let's find the ship. And he's like, they keep moving the ship. I don't know what we're going to do. And so the next that we see William on the very last page of this book, we've just had the beautiful wedding of Sylvia and Bobby. And William comes riding onto the ridge. And the last thing he asks is for Jamie to help him. And that's the end of the book. <laughs> so it's kind of a cliffhanger. But it's not some of the worst cliffhangers we've ever had, but it's also like Lord John is in serious, serious peril. Like he is in danger of his life right now. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, what will Jamie be able to do? How long did it take William to get there? I mean, we've seen our friends like traveling and it takes them weeks and weeks to get places. Or how long did it take William to get here? How long will it take them to get back? How long will will this Ezekiel Richardson wait before he kills him? You know, is the fate of the revolution really on the line because of this? Like, what does it mean? So anyway, that's where we end it. Let's discuss. Okay, so now I'm going to make my, um, I have one prediction, not even a prediction, but like an explanation that I wanted to share. So let me turn to it. So Everybody knows, and whenever new people start reading these books, okay, invariably, if it's a friend of mine, they're like, so does Diane ever explain that ghost of a Scotsman who looks like Jamie, who is in Edinburgh when, um, in Inverness when, like, Frank is outside her window? And every time I'm like, we don't know yet. She said, we'll know by the end of the series, but nope, we don't know. You know, they always will ask me that. And this time, I, I think that there's some clues in this book as to what that is. So there specifically is a chapter in here. And we've seen this happen before where when Jamie is on the brink of war or dealing with a heavy thing, he will see the specters, the ghosts of those he's loved. He's seen his father before, but mostly he sees Dougal and Murtaugh. He sees them beside him as like a fully formed specter that he will talk to and go over strategies with and things like that. Now, before a certain battle in this book, that same thing is happening. He is on a mountain and he's talking with Murtaugh and Dougal. But this time there's a specter of Frank 
And it's not just his voice in his head, but because he's been reading Frank's book, he is having like a conversation with Frank. Now it isn't the same kind of conversation that he has with Dougal or Murta. Like literally even in the text, the way that the text is written, it's written as if Dougal is speaking to him, as if Murta is right there and he's speaking to him. Whereas when he's speaking with Frank, it says just the specter of Frank is there. And then the words are in italic, like they're a whisper in his head instead of being spoken directly to him. But Jamie answers him because Frank is saying, you know what's going to happen to you at this battle. And he's like, no, you haven't been here. You just wrote it down. I'm not going to believe everything you say just because you wrote it down. You haven't lived here. But he talks to him. So my kind of thought about this, and I've always, I've always said that I believe that that ghost appears there because he's looking in on Claire right before she's about to come back to him. You know, I've always believed that whenever Jamie does die, because like he will be dead eventually, his spirit will then be waiting for Claire and then it will start all over again. That's what I believe is happening. I don't think it necessarily has to be anything like super magical. It's just the love story of Jamie and Claire could happen over and over and over again. Like it, it can happen continually, right? And my thought this time is that this time when it, like when that's happening, Jamie's like Jamie the ghost will know everything that's happened before and he will know you know, he knows who Frank is and like what part he plays in all this. And what if it's Jamie kind of checking in and like he's doing his part to kind of haunt Frank or to check in on him or maybe even to thank him in a sense because without Frank, a lot of what happens couldn't happen, you know? I don't know. And we never get, we never get a chapter from Frank's point of view. We never do. Who's to say that when Frank is writing these books, when he's digging into this history, that he himself doesn't see a specter, that he doesn't recall that specter of Jamie Fraser and curse him or talk to him or question him. Like we don't know because we will we'll never see those things from Frank's point of view. So that's kind of my thought on it. And again, it's not a complete answer, but who's to say Diana will even give us a complete answer? Like I'm sure she will show us how that happens. But even when, you know, like she doesn't explain how Claire's magic works. She doesn't explain how the time travel works. It just is. And it's up to our characters to figure it out if they want to. You know, that's part of Brie, Brie trying to write the time travelers, you know, the guide for time travelers, you know. So I don't know. But yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on this. So that was a lot of talking. My mouth is tired. And I need to have some lunch now, but I would love more than anything to discuss this with you down below now. Um, let me know if they're what your favorite moments were, other parts you want to talk about. If you have thoughts on anything that I said, if I was wrong about anything, please bring it up because I took notes, but there's a lot in here. So anyway, we're going to close this at about one hour. I did it. So thank you so much for watching this. You made it all the way through. Give me the B emoji because you know what? That would just make my heart so happy to know you made it all the way through this. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. I have lots of Outlander content that will be coming with the show coming back and all that fun jazz. So thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time.